It is July 9th, 2024, and as Israel continues on with its genocidal bombardment and blockade of the Palestinian people within the Gaza Strip, we continue to learn more and more about what is actually happening on the ground, about the consequences of the actions that are being taken by Israel and, of course, supported by the United States. And as always, although the media here in the West doesn't act like it, there is so much important context for us to continue to keep in mind, which is why I was able to discuss all of this and more earlier with a special guest. So let's take a listen to that conversation now. Joining me now to discuss is Dan Kovalik, a human rights and labor rights lawyer, professor, and author of the new book, The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care, which I have right here, and I would encourage everyone to get a copy of it. Dan, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. Thank you, Rachel. Now, I'm glad I get a chance to talk to you about this. I did. I really enjoyed reading your new book, and I thought it was very timely. It feels like every week we learn more and more about Israel's bombardment and blockade of the Gaza Strip and the impact it's had on the Palestinian people there. I know that the latest Lancet report is estimating that the death toll could be close to 200,000 killed. That's five times higher than what is officially being reported. And in this book, you described it as a slow, patient, but systematic genocide in which Palestinians have been really dehumanized, treated as terrorists for decades now. Will you take us through how that campaign has really played a role in allowing this real-time genocide to take place that is committed by Israel with help from the U.S.? Yes. Well, I think, you know, first of all, we could start, you know, and I'll go through it quickly. We could start in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration, which was this declaration um, out of Great Britain that first said that they aspired to give uh, Jews a homeland in Israel. They did mention as kind of a footnote that, well, and the rights of the Palestinians should be protected, something like that. But in fact, they never were, right? I mean, the, essentially the Palestinians since that time, their, what they wanted, their rights to land, their rights to live in their homes, has never been respected. And frankly, the British really uh, defended the uh, Israelis, um, their ability to, to gain more and more land and property in Palestine. And of course, in 1948, the UN said, uh, had passed a resolution giving um, Jews about 50%, more or less, of the land of Palestine, even though Jews represented a very s small percentage at that point of Palestine. And then, of course, uh, the Israelis ended up taking much more land than that, than even the UN was given. But again, the world seemed not to care. Right, the Nakba happened in 1948, in which 750,000 Palestinians are displaced, thousands of Palestinians are killed, and this barely made a footnote in history. And then over time, again, you had in 1967 the Six Day War, Six Days War, in which Israel took even more land and began to occupy both the West Bank and Gaza. And particularly within Gaza, they began to take even more and more land over time. And again, this happened, as you mentioned, kind of in a slow, progressive, not, not in a positive, progressive way, but in a step-by-step -step way. Um, and again, the way it was able to happen is that the Palestinians were almost invisible in the world. You know, while the UN did pass resolutions saying Palestinians have a right to return, um, those were never enforced, and the Palestinians continued to lose more and more ground. And then uh, a big event that happened in the late 2000s, I want to say 2008, 2009, uh, Israel had been occupying Gaza since 1967 up to that point. The um, prime minister of uh, Israel at that time, I believe it was Ariel Sharon, decided we don't want to occupy this. It's too expensive. It's too messy. We're going to leave Gaza. The Israelis are going to leave Gaza. But what we're going to do, we're going to fence it all in. And we're going to control all the food that comes in, all the water that comes in. 
We're going to control their daily lives, who comes and who goes. And so we'll control it that way, but we won't have a physical presence there. And this became even worse for the people of Gaza because basically they became isolated from the world. Their economy was destroyed. Uh, Israel counted the number of calories per person. Uh, that was necessary for the Palestinians to survive and guaranteed that they got just a little less than that. And so you had a situation in which, you know, a number of commentators said Palestinians were living, is known Chomsky, Chomsky said, in the largest open-air prison in the world. Others said it's a concentration camp. I think both are pretty apt um, uh, metaphors. And... Um, and so by about 2018, the United Nations said that Gaza would be completely unlivable by 2020. That means four years ago. And that pretty much came to pass. I mean, where there was very little fresh water, there was very, again, the food was meager, electricity was rationed. There had been a series of Israeli uh, attacks on Gaza over the years, which destroyed critical infrastructure. And so by the time you get to October 7, 2023, which everyone, you know, a lot of people think was the beginning of history, right? Mm -hmm. The people of Gaza were in a terrible, were in terrible shape. I mean, they really were living in abject poverty. They were mostly uh, dependent on international aid. And that was by design so that even that aid could be administered or withheld in order to control them. Of course, now it's been almost totally withheld. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the book, after October 7th, that slow-moving genocide becomes a fast-moving genocide. It becomes a type of genocide that we think about, where you have, as you say, possibly you know close to 200,000 people killed, mostly women and children. You have all of the critical infrastructure, for the most part, destroyed hospitals, universities, um, mosques, churches, uh, UN buildings, UN refugee buildings, you name it, most of it's gone. I think 75% of the infrastructure is destroyed. So we're witnessing something quite terrible, Rachel. Um, and for the first time, we're able to see it in real time in these videos on social media. And that's been critical for the Palestinians because the mainstream press hasn't done a good job covering it, but they can't hide it because it's it's in the social media every 15 minutes you can pull up your phone and see someone else killed or being dug out of rubble yeah oh absolutely and i think that that's the the big thing especially when you look at the mainstream media and the way that they have treated this i mean i remember going back to 2014 that's one of the things that led me to seek out independent media sources and to become more involved in that because I was looking at the way that the mainstream media was reporting on Israel's bombing of Gaza and going, okay, what, what's the other side of the story, right? They're telling you exactly what Israel wants them to tell you, but they're not telling you about the plight of the Palestinians or as you were pointing out the context around that, because they absolutely do act as though this all started on October 7th of last year. And there was no lead up to that, no decades of oppression that then got us to where we are now. And I thought one really interesting quote from your book was you said, well, one of the worst things you can say about someone is that they are a Holocaust or genocide denier. Israel has made it state policy to deny the reality of the Nakba. And I thought that, that was really powerful because we're in a time right now where, again, going back to that context, going back to everything that Palestinians have been through and not just being dehumanized, but being, you know, forced out of their land or forced into the Gaza Strip in a situation where, as you were saying, every single thing around them is controlled. How important has controlling the public narrative become for Israel and by extension for the U.S.? Well, it's been absolutely critical. It's allowed the U.S. to give something like $3 billion a year, $3 billion plus dollars a year to Israel without any question, right? But it's a bipartisan issue. Again, up till October 8th or so, you had almost no protests over this, very little protests. 
uh, because most people accepted, oh, well, Israel's a good country and, and it, it's a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East, it claims. It has the most moral army in the world, it claims. And of course, it was founded after the Holocaust, which is true, though, again, the plans for creating it were much earlier than that. And that's important to understand. Um, and so uh, the Israelis had so much sympathy uh, around the world, despite, again, a lot of terrible things they did. They had so much goodwill built up that um, people were willing to look the other way. And again, they didn't knew nothing about the Palestinians. Most people in the U.S. has never met a Palestinian. They wouldn't know what a Palestinian was uh, if they met one. Um, and so the, and again, the propaganda campaign, which, which made Israel look like, uh, you know, in the words of Netanyahu, like the forces of light, and then the Palestinians as the forces of darkness, terrorists and whatnot, allowed this very uncritical support of Israel year after year after year. And um, to the point where really, you know, language was, was, uh, has been done violence to, you know, even recently that uh, the papers, or I, there was an instance in which I forget which mainstream source referred to the, the murder of a three-year-old girl in Gaza, a three-year-old Palestinian said that a young lady had been killed in Gaza, a three-year-old young lady. And then, of course, they referred to like an 18-year-old um, uh, woman, an Israeli woman who was killed as a girl. So the point, you know, and, and you see this over and over. I mentioned in the book that The, the Onion, which, you know, is a great satirical uh, publication, they had, a, you know, everything they say is a joke, but it's based on reality. And one, one, one joke headline was that the New York Times invents new language to be able to, you know, cover up the genocide in um, in Gaza. And, you know, again, that's an exaggeration, but it's not too much of an exaggeration. So um, that, you know, the, the double standard applied to the Israelis and Palestinians has been critical, absolutely critical to undermining the Palestinians, really their right to even exist. And that really has only changed since October 7th. And again, largely it's changed because of social media, not because of the mainstream press that try, has been trying desperately to hold on to the old narrative. But social media has just destroyed it. It's just destroyed the, the, the narrative. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm with you on that one. And I think even just the the framing of any time, let's say that someone in Ukraine is killed, they're like, you know, Russia targeted and killed Ukrainian civilian, even if that's not what happened. And then when it comes to Gaza, they're like, oh, person was killed. And you're going, okay, but it was by an Israeli airstrike. I mean, there's no other airstrike that is targeting this region and you're just going to frame it like that. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly how they do it and how they've been doing it for a while now. Now, another really interesting part that I'm glad that you wrote about this because I was not as familiar with this, so I learned a lot from it, was about the origin of the Likud party. Because I think that when it comes to Netanyahu in the US, they love to frame him almost as this kind of madman who's out there on his own, right? They're like, oh, Netanyahu is the bad one, right? He's the one who's a little too extreme. Let's blame this on him so that if the day comes where he's no longer prime minister, then they act like, hey, we fixed everything, we moved on. But the reality is that the Likud party, the way that they came about and I think kind of their beliefs along the way over the decades has gotten us to this point. So you would think if anyone was paying attention, they shouldn't really be surprised by how we got here. But were you surprised at all in your research to see kind of how Israel got to this point where it's not just Netanyahu who's extreme? No, it's his entire party. And that makes up a very important portion of the Israeli government. Yes, and I've been, I have, I was surprised in my research, and frankly, I've been surprised over time how the situation in Israel has evolved or devolved from having a significant left in the country that still supported the Zionist project, but at least wanted a kinder and gentler, you know, 
uh, project, right? Um, but you had, uh, I was surprised to learn about uh, uh, Netanyahu and the Likud party and its origins, which, which go back to the founding of Israel and Menachem Begin's uh, party, which again was a more uh, right-wing party, though not as right-wing, by the way, as some parties in Israel. Um, it, you know, and their whole philosophy from the beginning was, you know, their their rallying cry was from the river to the sea. Everything would be Israel, right? And and there would be no Palestinians. It was a, a more much more radical uh, a philosophy. And I meant, and I didn't know this when I wrote the book. I found that letter that Einstein and and uh, and others intellectuals wrote to the New York Times in 1948, in which they decry the Nakba, they call Menachem Begin a fascist and his party a fascist party. And again, what happens is over time, Menachem Begin, he becomes prime minister in the 70s and his party eventually becomes or morphs into the Likud party. And of course, the Likud party has been in power for a long time now. Netanyahu himself has been in power for over 20 years. I mean, Israel's only existed for a little over 75. I mean, right? And then he had Menachem Begin's term and some others. And so basically, uh, if you look at the last 50 years, it's been Begin's party or its uh, successor that has largely ruled Israel. And not, and not because it's done so against the will of his, the Israeli people. It's because that's largely what they wanted. And the progressives, you know, you had your socialist Zionists, you had even your communist Zionists, you had your labor Zionists. Most of those folks have left Israel because they, you know, because they couldn't stand this. They could not stand the right word drift. But as Einstein in 48 and others predicted that this would be the inevitable drift, this, that it had to end this way, because when you have a whole nation based on the displacement of another people and where that's critical to your very existence is that those people be displaced and forcibly displaced. And that he, the whole philosophy is that you have a single religion state, right? Um, it's going to end badly, right? I mean, that's why in this country we believe in the separation of church and state. We, we tend to be very critical of theocracies, right? And yet we've carved out an incredible exception for Israel where they're allowed to have a theocracy. They're allowed to, you know, even... Uh, the non-Jews they have within Israel, the Arabs they have within Israel, the Muslims they have within Israel that are citizens are still second class citizens. And those who are outside the boundaries of Israel, um, but within historic Palestine are treated as less than even human. And um, again, when, when that's your starting point, your end point's not going to be good. And that, and we're seeing the end point. We are seeing, and I would not 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 have used these words before October seventh because they have an, an import. They have a meaning taken from Nazi Germany, and that is this is the final solution. Is Hitler had a final solution for the Jews? What we're seeing is the final solution Israel has for the Palestinians, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, I don't. I honor the memory of the Holocaust and those who died in it. And I don't, you know, compare things to it lightly, but this, I don't see how you can look at it any other way, but this is the Israeli's final solution. So when you give that number that you gave at the outset, that almost 200,000 Palestinians have been killed, that is something like 8% of the population of Gaza. Soon it'll be 10%. Soon it'll be 15, maybe 20. I mean, you're looking at, you are looking at a real genocide, right? And, and again, every day this goes on, those numbers are going to climb uh, greatly because the famine is setting in, right? We're seeing pictures of children emaciated, skin and bone. Again, pictures like we saw from Nazi concentration camps. 
And the borders are completely sealed. There is no aid going in. There's no water. There's no food. That port that Biden set up, which was a joke to begin with, it's apparently f f floating somewhere out in the Mediterranean. They don't plan on putting it back. So there's no plan to provide these folks with life-saving um, items. And it's just it's just terrible. I'm in communication with people in Gaza. I, I, if I can, Rachel, I was talking to a friend in, in Gaza this morning. Uh, her name is Ola. She's a journalist. Or she was before October 7th. I mean, now people have no jobs of any kind. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, she said, Dan, I'm caught between snipers and bombs. Um, and she said to me, if anything happens to me, you're a good friend. Thank you for everything. I mean, she seemed to be saying goodbye to me, you know, and she, before October 7th, was one of the most hopeful, happy people I ever met. And uh, as the days have gone on since then, I mean, not surprisingly, she's lost hope. You know, she has no food or water or very little. Um think about that not just the inability to drink water but that means not showering for months and, you know think about the the conditions these folks are living in i mean it's horrifying and it's very hot there now mm -hmm. it's roughly the weather is very similar to the east coast of the united states so you're looking at temperatures in the 80s 90s humid uh, think about that, living without water, without any electricity to even turn on a fan. It's terrible, Rachel. It's terrible. And it's going to get worse. Every day this goes on, it's going to get worse. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, I that was one thing that I really kind of took away from your book was when you were talking about the people that you had met and the people that you had talked to in Gaza and in the West Bank. And there's just this feeling of resilience, right? These people have been through so much, but yet even with as much resilience as they have, I cannot even imagine, right? None of us can fathom what they are going through right now because we have really nothing to compare it to even on our, you know, worst or hardest day. It's like, we've never faced anything like the last nine months that the Palestinians in Gaza have gone through. And to think that even after, you know, surviving bombs, surviving this and that, even starving their way through it, it's like, if they get a single injury, if they get some kind of disease, they don't have any medical care. You know, it's not just like, oh, okay, we're going to go fix this. There is no solution for some of the major problems that they continue to face. And, you know, all of this comes back to not just what Israel's doing, but of course, what the U.S. is supporting. And this another thing I learned here that you pointed out, which was this conversation that Mr. Joe Biden had with then Prime Minister Again, Begin. Menachem, Menachem Begin, yeah. There you go, but Prime Minister Begin. I believe it was in about 1982, but at the time, and that was another thing you pointed out, was that, look, U.S. presidents have actually stood up to Israel, right? You had Eisenhower and Reagan, who had at least done something, right? Something more than Biden has done. And yet, no, at the time, Biden was cheering on the killing of Lebanese civilians by Israel. And it seemed to even put Begin in a place where he was like, who is this guy? What is he? Right? He, he's beyond even just where Israel was at the time. But to think that, oh, Biden was a senator then, now he's the sitting president of the United States and he's allowing Israel to continue on committing genocide, right? He knows that there's a case before the International Court of Justice. He knows that they are looking at it as a genocide case. And yet he's like, ah, yeah, no, you know, just continue on. Of course, on the other side, we have Donald Trump, which I feel like he would be exactly the same way, maybe a little tweaks here and there. But what does that tell us about knowing where Biden was in the 1980s, what he believed then? And how it's progressed to 2024 where he's now the commander in chief and we're seeing the results of that when it comes to U.S. support for Israel. Yeah, I think it's very significant. Again, when you're outflanked from the left by Ronald Reagan, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what to say about that. And yeah, the, the conversation was that, you know, Biden told Begin, he said, you know, if Canadians, you know, struck us, I'd be, you know, be attacking 
Canadian civilians myself. And Begum was like, uh, you know. Um, but people forget who Biden was. Biden was a segregationist. He was, uh, you know, this guy has always been a right wing Democrat. And, you know, now people think of him so differently. I, I see so many people like on Facebook saying, oh, Biden has such a big heart. It's like there's absolutely no evidence for this, that he has a big heart. He may seem like he does because he's very old and kind of infirm. And I guess he comes off is at least harmless. But when you look at his roots and you see what he's doing now, which is continuing to send munitions and arms to Israel as they need them, including 2,000 pound bombs. He has sent thousands of 2,000 pound bombs to Israel to use against Gaza, which, I mean, that has to be emphasized. And I quote some military experts, U.S. military experts, saying they wouldn't use 500 pound bombs in an urban theater like that because all it would do is kill civilians. I mean, it, it's just going to blow up whole neighborhoods. And Israel's using 2,000 pound bombs. By now, Israel has used a tonnage of bombs in Gaza exceeding Nagasaki and Hiroshima combined by many multiples against a tiny population in a tiny area um, that's roughly the size of Manhattan, right? Um, so, but in, did, no matter what Biden says, that he cares about civilians in Gaza or that he's talking to, to Netanyahu to calm down, he continues to send the bombs. And it's those actions you have to look at. And again, the port's another thing, you know, Instead of telling Israel, let the trucks come in with aid, right, through the Rafah crossing with Egypt, with the other uh, crossings, and that's the lifeline for the people of Gaza, right? Uh, there were 500 truckloads a day coming in before October 7th. That's all that has to happen. Let those trucks in. Instead, he says, we're going to set up a port, which even had it worked, officials admitted would not get a fraction of 500 trucks in a day. So the whole thing is kabuki theater at best. You know, he's telling his base things to placate him. Meanwhile, he's supporting this genocide to the hill. And again, as you say, given who, where he came from, it's not surprising in the least. Yeah, and I think that that's something that more Americans need to be aware of, right? Because Biden has kind of tried to play the center, right? He claims, oh, you know, we're, we're, we built this port. Look what we're doing for the Palestinians. And it's like, yeah, you're still sending the bombs to kill them. If you give them a little bit more aid, that doesn't, I mean, I guess it keeps them alive longer until they're then killed by a bomb. But that is the, the current place that we're in right now. Now, one last quote that I wanted to bring up, you said that while the case for Palestine could have many meanings, at the time of this writing, it minimally means the case for allowing Palestine and the Palestinian people to exist and to live. And, you know, this is not the first genocide we've seen, right? This is not the first mass killing of people or the ethnic cleansing of people that we've gone through as a world. And yet, it, it seems like in so many cases, there is this fight to literally just say, hey, the Palestinian people have a right to exist and they have a right to exist on the land that is their land. And yet when it comes to Israel and Israel's plans, another thing that you pointed out in the book was how a lot of this has happened in plain sight, right? Israel has had these plans to try to ethnically cleanse the Gaza Strip. Now they're targeting the West Bank even more. And they've had, there have been a number of plans drawn out saying, oh, you know, we'll just send the Palestinians into the Sinai Desert, or we'll have other countries around the world take in more and more refugees. And it's like, there is this greater plan that is now raising, well, not even just concerns, but the realization that we're looking at a second Nakba, what is, I guess, the biggest takeaway that you would hope that people would get from not just your writing, but watching kind of what's happening today and the significance of what we're seeing right now? Well, I think, you know, as I mentioned in the book, you know, there's this memes, meme that's been circulating saying, you know, if you wondered what you would do as a German during the Holocaust, you know now. 
And I think that is the biggest takeaway that that right now we are witnessing a genocide of a people. It's being done with weapons. Our country, meaning the U U.S., the United States, is being done with our weapons, our munitions. It could not happen without that, and without the U.S.'s diplomatic support of Israel, it, the, the the support given Israel is absolutely critical. And with that support, Israel's carrying out a genocide as terrible as any genocide that you can think of. And so if you think that during the Holocaust, you would have been a resistor, you would have protested against Hitler, you might have even taken up arms against Hitler. Again, you need to think about, well, what are you doing right now? Are you resisting this in any way? Because we, you have the moral culpability for this. Yeah. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, people will look back at this in great shame, mostly for what they didn't do to stop it. And I would tell people, don't be one of those people. Be able to look back with some pride that you stood up. And there are people standing up. And that is the beautiful thing. That is something that gives the people in Gaza hope. They know their students that have been protesting. They know other people have been protesting. It gives them hope. And, and I, you know, it gives me hope for the American people. When I see people throughout the country, even the, in the Lone Star State, your Lone Star State <laughs> protesting in Dallas, Texas, cowboys on, uh, on uh, horses protesting for Palestine, it warms the cockles of my heart. We have good people in this country. And most people don't want this war. And we need to make our government listen to us. That That's the takeaway, I think. And my internet decided it was going to freeze up and stop working at that point. But that was Dan Kovalik, a human and labor rights lawyer, professor, and author of the new book, The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. And I would definitely encourage y'all to check out this new book. And that's going to do it for this video. As always, if anything resonated with you, be sure to like it, share it with your friends, leave a comment. And as always, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to keep up with all of my work, make sure that you're subscribed to my page on Substack. That's rachelblevins.substack.com. And if you want to support my work, you can also check out my page on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash rachelblevins. That's where you can sign up as a monthly paid subscriber and join the community there. As always, thank y'all so much for all of your support and I'll see you next time.